was hired by the government of Sardar to dig up the skeletons of giants. We always carried the bones and the artifacts we found into the church. So they would make the skeletons disappear. And the church was always involved because they didn't want people talking. So we asked the priest, uh, uh, what are we supposed to do with the skeleton? And he said, uh, break it into pieces and bury it under the foundation of the house. I personally excavated two skeletons that were more than 10 feet tall. A portal opened, a doorway, and the giants came up out of the earth. It's almost like they were eaten on the run. This was the violent overthrow of the Anasazi. Tens of thousands of artifacts were carted off to the Smithsonian's repositories, including the bones of the giants. At the turn of the 19th century, bodies of giants were turning up all over the United States. All over the island of Sardinia, there are massive stone sepulchers famed since time immemorial as tombs of the giants. Everywhere the megalithic towers stood, the tombs of the giants were close by. There may be tens of thousands of giants still buried in the soils of Sardinia today. history of America, but secretive institutions have worked behind the scenes to conceal a darker secret. There were giants in the earth in those days. Cloud eaters, as the tribal leaders knew them, not only existed, they brought ritual cannibalism and pre-Columbian dragon-worshipping interlopers to ancient American soil. And then they took women and fathered hideous monsters. Their secret has been known to academics and underground societies for hundreds of years. I was very young when I visited the Grand Canyon for my very first time on a family vacation. And it was an extraordinary experience for me. I loved it. There I was looking at the, what they call the monuments of the Grand Canyon, and at the time, nobody really paid attention to the names of the uh, features of the Grand Canyon. Um, it, I'm 51 years old now, and it wasn't until I started investigating what I felt was needed to be investigated in the Grand Canyon concerning the Egyptian artifact find down in the underground dwellings, citadels, that, and the Asian artifacts. They had hieroglyphics and they had, um, they had things that were taken by the Smithsonian Institute in the year uh, 1907 and 1909. 1909 is when the Phoenix Gazette came out with their article chronicling uh, uh, G.E. Kincaid who was sent from the Smithsonian Institute to uh, do an archaeological investigation there. And that's when it was discovered that Egyptian artifacts, indeed, were there. But no news from then on. And people talk about that experience, uh, and it's wrapped in myth. Very difficult to understand it unless you're connected with the Hopi Indian tribe. 
and other Indian tribes that would tell you otherwise what that canyon really is. And I think that uh, I pretty much discovered just through an intellectual survey of what it might be and then a uh, little over a year ago here at the University of Arizona Library I decided to pull out one of the topographical maps of the Grand Canyon to see if the stars of Orion would match up with any of the uh, pinnacles the highest peaks the altitude peaks of this topographical map sure enough it didn't take but about 20 minutes to size that star chart which I created a transparency out of in Photoshop and uh, and I got the alignment what seems to really fit are the major stars that are not the belt stars that we find in the Giza Plateau with the three great pyramids they happen to be uh, the shoulder stars uh, Betelgeuse and Bellatrix and then the kneecap stars I think you would call that the hunter constellation of Orion that is Orion South and Rigel and then Mintaka would be one of the stars of the belt system and those were the major ones they lined up with Isis temple they lined up with uh, Isis temple is Rigel matches up with Sumner Butte Bellatrix matches up with Isis temple Betelgeuse matches up with Tower of Set and uh, south line up with O'Neill Butte where the natural arch is and it's quite possible that reorienting this I might get other matches but these are the ones that turned out to be the closest and recently I've been looking at uh, the Pleiades star system and so that was astounding to me and and it just made sense that all along in my life I couldn't figure out why a, a river could have carved angles into the rock formations which seem to appear to be block formations that when you look at the Isis temple for instance it looks like a stepped pyramid and if one were to restructure it by moving all the dirt that has fallen from the sides creating the angles in between the uh, the right angles you could probably form these into the four-sided pyramids that we find down in South America the Mayan pyramids no river could have formed some of the features that we see at Isis temple at Isis temple it appears to be a wall in a circular form a river can't make those sharp bends and then create you know perfect 90 degree angles in there and then form a almost like a uh, circular sweep on both sides and so it amazes me that in geology they don't address these issues I think that most of the river rocks that would uh, otherwise have sharp edges have been rounded off we only find them where the river is at but it doesn't appear that we find them above the surface of the water This shows you where most of them come from, where the reports come from. We've actually got over a thousand reports now from all over North, just North America, within the North American continent, not going into, even going into Canada or Mexico, just in North America. You can clearly see where they congregate heavily is in Ohio uh, and Pennsylvania. This is a whole Ohio Valley mound culture area which is somewhere I've explored at length um, a, a couple of years ago and, uh, and I was exploring with Ross Hamilton uh, and others and even up in New England where there's many megalithic sites up in this area here we find hundreds of megalithic structures dolmens, uh, chambers, standing stones, even stone circles uh, and here we have over a hundred thousand recorded earthworks and mounds have been recorded in North America mainly along this area of the Mississippi spreading east and west but also we, have, we find mounds all are down here and even on Catalina Island uh, over here and even on the very east coast of New England up in Maine where you get these very very ancient stone mounds going back to seven or eight thousand years so on either side of the country there have been archaeological discoveries going back to seven to eight thousand years old which is much older than the official dating of the mound culture peoples 
Each of some examples here. Uh, we've got so many. I, did, I, I just threw a random selection in, really. Uh, but just to give you, you know, some examples of differences and um, correspondences here. Uh, this is from Kern County, California. Um, Workmen in the new uh, area in Jeffersonville exhumed 12 feet from the surface, a, a part of the skeleton of a giant uh, who's 12 feet high. Uh, here we have in Oakland, California. We're starting on the, on the west side. That the skeleton is that of a man at least eight feet tall. Here, uh, this is in Oregon. Uh, the skull, jawbone, thigh, and other parts of the larger skull indicated a man of my mind at least eight feet high. The bones were uncovered fully 20 feet below the surface, suggesting extreme antiquity. Again, uh, in the, this, this area uh, in the desert around um, Los Angeles, uh, California, uh, of relics of an ancient civilization whose men were eight to nine feet tall in the Colorado desert near the Arizona, Nevada, California border. These giants are clothed in garments consisting of a medium length jacket and trouser extending slightly below the knees. Very cool. The texture of the material is said to resemble grey dried sheepskin but obviously it was taken from an animal unknown today. Again, this just shows you the kind of technology that they were kind of working with. This is an example, this is actually from uh, Catalina Island where they've actually found hundreds of giant skeletons uh, and recently a report, sorry, a researcher there, when they were cleaning the whole area of this, uh, this guy called Gideon's Museum, they found this whole box of lost reports, records and recollections and photos uh, and this is one of the ones that popped out of it um, and it's been kind of very heavily suppressed the whole Catalina Island discovery basically they found they believe there was there was a stone circle on Catalina Island off the coast of California they found evidence of uh, ritual uh, stone working uh, advanced technology they were a fair-skinned uh, blonde and red-haired race that existed there at least uh, some people say four or five thousand years ago this is one example here. One of the skulls measured 26 and a half inches around and the body bones with it indicate that the men were fully seven feet in height. There were much larger ones found there as well. This just gives you one example. Getting back to some footprints, these are the, the very controversial uh, Paluxy footprints from Texas. Uh, the unusual thing about these ones is that they are right next to dinosaur footprints. Uh, these are very, very long. Uh, you can see the length of them there, a couple of feet long. <laughs> no pun intended, uh, but the dinosaur footprints right next to it are sort of, I don't know why they're going in different directions, but they are. And these were found on a whole layer of bedrock that kind of got covered up over different um, epochs. Still in that general area, we go to Nevada and the famous Lovelock Caves uh, mum mum mummies and skeletons that have been discovered. Um, they were said to be a legendary tribe of red-haired cannibalistic giants. That is going to scare you if you meet a bunch of them, isn't it? Um, but you, just you can see the size of them, you can see the jaw size on the top right there compared to a normal jaw. And on the bottom right, uh, this is one of their, their sandals that they even wore, that was, uh, that was um, managed to survive many thousands of years. The whole story goes that they were actually the um, Piute uh, oral history, who were the Native American tribe of that area, were terrorized by these, these red-haired cannibalistic giants and even they would be eaten by them. If there wasn't enough food to go around, the giants would just turn up the places these, these uh, Native Americans were staying and just go and grab them and eat them. It's pretty scary. I mean, you know, that size jaw coming after you, it, it would be pretty scary. And so what they did is that the, the Puty all got together and they, when, when all the giants, they, they, they chased all the giants into Lovelock Caves. This is going back, you know, over 150, no, several hundred years, because the, as the legend states, they actually got them, hid them in it and then made a massive fire at the entrance of the cave and killed them all, smoked them all out and took out this whole race of giants who lived in the Nevada area. Some of them uh, didn't get burnt, were actually mummified, they actually very, very sophisticated mummified remains and they all had red and blonde hair again and this pale skin, uh, suggesting a much earlier prehistoric race of unknown origin uh, existed in that area. This actually shows you a rare photo on the left there of one of the skulls that have now been removed from display. In most other museums you get that. It's partly to do with the NAGPRA Act, the Native American Graves uh, Repatriation uh, Act. I think that's the right order of words, I'm not sure. And on the bottom right there you can see the powerful jaws that would have munched on humans. Uh, and here, in, in, in just not too far from there in Utah, uh, more red-haired uh, and wavy-haired, a white race in America, thousands of years old. These were, the, you know, 
um, years before the Indians or the cliff dwellers, it states. This one out on the left here is actually from um, San Diego. It was actually discovered in San Diego. Uh, it's, uh, I think, 10 feet high. Uh, again, it, it was, had red hair and it was mummified. And on the right-hand side, it's very similar, very the same size, same style of mummification, red hair, fair skin mummy from China, which is 3,000, I believe, 3,600 around that area BC. So we're looking, we're finding correspondences all over the world. Um, this is just nicely placed uh, bones here um, to go for the skull and crossbones look. Um, these were found uh, actually in New Jersey uh, in Tuckerton. One of the skeletons measured over seven feet and was that of a veritable giant. Um, and he was actually killed by some blunt weapon. Uh, and on the right hand side here, this is um, Pleasantville, uh, New Jersey, I think, or, or Baltimore. Um, they run in size from a small child to several of seven feet in height, and one, supposed to be an old medicine man, must have been at least eight feet in height. So this is over in New Jersey, uh, on the eastern side of America. Even in Connecticut, there's extremely ancient uh, bones and skeletons to be found that predate anything that should be there. Um, and they were flattened heads, so they were uh, altering the skull shape in North America. And this goes back potentially uh, to 7,000 years. There's other reports in New England of that kind of era. It's very strange. Uh, very great, great strength. A perfect set of teeth of unusual size, probably for eating humans. Again, this is in uh, Syracuse. This is Western New York. And there's a whole area here of mounds. This is the most, really the most um, Western area of the traditional um, Ohio Valley mound culture peoples. Um, Back in 1876, when they excavated one of these mounds, or probably um, looted, I, I, I probably imagine, they found um, skeletons nine feet high um, and other examples in that area. And these are the two, and then it was reconstructed uh, by this guy here, who actually decided to, he measured, his grandfather measured the bones, so he, he reconstructed these models and have, has them on display in a museum you can actually still visit. Uh, obviously, the skeletons have been taken away. Um, again, this again, this shows you in Massachusetts, the oldest human skeleton earth in New England, believed to be 7,000 years old, may have been from a man of European origins. And we are seeing these examples of these giant skeletons with the connections with, with Britain and, uh, and Ireland. Um, this is just uh, from an area near Boston. Uh, one of the larger mounds was entered years ago and five very large skeletons were removed. Not much detail about that one, but it was there. Uh, this is me posing at McKee's Mound. We spent eight hours trying to find this mound where the skeleton was, uh, this large, giant skeleton was buried, but all that was left was um, a pile of sand and a sign. Uh, so we were quite disappointed. But this whole area here, 33 skeletons were found with some beautiful artifacts. But several of the skeletons were giants. They don't mention that on the sign. Uh, this is actually shows you some of the skeletons when they were discovered. Uh, the Keys Mound north of Pittsburgh and reported in the newspaper. Uh, now we get into Ohio, there's so many reports here, it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, Ross Hamilton's done the main research here. Uh, eight feet tall giant there. Uh, another one on the right, a man must have been at least 11 feet high. This is actually up in Michigan. And we have the famous um, uh, Grave Creek Mound in West Virginia. Um, this is the largest uh, mound in that in, in the country actually. It's almost as big as Silbury Hill in England. Um, 70 feet tall, a diameter of 295 feet. 60,000 tonnes of earth and rock uh, were used to make this. And there was an ex the first excavation took there, uh, was there in 1838. They yielded two large skeletons, um, one female and one male. The, the female one was said to be of European origin. She shows you some pictures of it here and the map of the area showing some of the geodetic connections between lots of the stone towers, mounds and earthworks around that whole area. Fascinating place. It's also where they found the Grave Creek Tablet, which is very unusual inscriptions, uh, which they suggest were Punic or European um, on this tablet. Uh, so it does give some credence to the European female skeleton being found there. Um, this is in, again in West Virginia, uh, the burial place of a noted chief who had been interred with unusual honours. At the bottom they found the bones of a human being measuring 7 feet in length and 19 inches across the shoulders. This is in the same area of West Virginia. 
even at a place called Miamisburg, very large, beautiful conical mound there. Uh, there's a whole story associated with this, but I'll just summarise that they found two skeletons, one in the mound and another in this stone coffin, which is about nine feet long. That was up, got discovered because a tree got blown over uh, in a storm. Even at Serpa Mound, uh, which is really the sort of omphalai of um, Ohio, the whole Ohio Valley culture, this is the, um, the best example of a serpent mound, there are others, this is the, mo the one that survived and being partly reconstructed, but it just shows you a very high level of sophistication. Each of the curves in it um, give very clear evidence of astronomical alignments, this is all on this high bluff here. Ross Hamilton has decoded this very brilliantly, and there's strange similarities to Glastonbury Tor. This is actually a photo, this is actually a postcard you could buy uh, about 80 years ago of a giant skeleton that was discovered in one of the mounds uh, surrounding the serpent mound. From there, which is his knee, it's been cut off at the knee, to his top of his head was seven foot. So with the shin and the foot on it as well, it probably would have been over eight feet tall. Um, so even at famous sites like um, Serpent Mound, we do find these kinds of examples. This is Ross Hamilton on the bottom right here. And this is my friend John, who's wearing a fantastic t-shirt. Um, this is actually a large monolith here which is a very similar shape, actually, to the one that has fallen down the eastern slope of Adam's calendar here in South Africa. This is the sort of top part of the ridge where Serpent Mound's on behind it. This is the stone here. And this, we believe, was actually in uh, this part here, the middle of the egg, which is sort of being held in the mouth. Well, we believe it's an egg. And it would have acted as some kind of lightning conductor. And uh, this is the only known megalith of that whole area in Ohio. Many native tribes around, around the world, many of the indigenous peoples around the world have the, same, the very same traditions uh, in terms of, um, for example, many of them believe that giants are buried in, under the hills and mounds. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they venerate the giants as ancestors, mm -hmm. progenitors, the sons of the gods. Mm -hmm. This is really interesting yeah. to me because uh, in the research I've done for my recent book, uh, the Great Inception, I found that there's a particular group of people from the ancient Near East, one of the tribes, one of the people groups that the Israelites had to push out of the Holy Land, who did the same thing. In fact, scholars within the last 30 years just translated a tablet from ancient Syria that was a, an invocation of the spirits of the Rephaim and a uh, council of the Datanu, and a scholar has uh, shown that that word Datanu is actually the root word for the Greek Titans. Titans. Yes. Uh, so That's right. yeah. it's, 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 it's the same thing from the other side of the planet. The Canaanites preserved much of, I shouldn't say much, some of the knowledge from the pre-flood world. Yes. The Canaanites, of course, were later called Phoenicians yes. by the Greeks. They were the great builders. They were right. the great masons. In fact, Solomon employed uh, the Phoenicians to mm. build the mm -hmm. temple. Alexander used the Phoenicians as a right. navy for mm -hmm. hire. They were the cream of the crop masons. That's where the Mason, Masonic order comes mm -hmm. from, actually, from the Phoenicians. The Egyptians hired them as well. That's right. And the Phoenicians, when you say Phoenician, you, you, th that word is synonymous with Canaanite. Mm -hmm. And the Canaanites uh, were some different tribes within there, but gener generally we call them Canaanites. And among them were the Nephilim and the Rephaim mm -hmm. and the, the, the Nephilim, generally speaking, for the, for the tribes of giants, genetic giants uh, that, that had the, uh, the bloodline of the Watchers mm -hmm. and so forth. One of the great mysteries of, of North America, which is the, uh, uh, the, the mystery of what happened to the Anasazi. First of all, what did you find out about that and how does it relate to the stories of the biblical giants? They were basically eaten by giants. So uh, that, and that's the, the, that's the information that, uh, that's part of the reason why we were in the desert southwest is we were, we were tracking uh, the, the Anasazi and exploring this uh, alternative historical narrative uh, that in fact they did not migrate away, they ran away. Mm -hmm. They fled for their lives and that the Anasazi were exterminated. This was something that occurred after the flood of Noah and uh, probably, as Tom says, uh, around the time when 
Moses was writing, and there were giants in the earth in those days. The Anasazi were perhaps being consumed, mm -hmm. eaten by giants in the desert southwest. And that was States. about the same time that the Canaanite Phoenician That's descendants right. of the Amorites were basically summoning the spirits of the Rephaim right. to bless the new king. And, and there is uh, a connection there. There yeah. is a connect that that connection with the 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 uh, Phoenicians, with the Canaanites in the United States and in other places of the earth is so strong. We were out there kind of on the trail, too, of not only just the biblical giants, but the Native American Stargate culture, Stargate understanding, and most importantly, the giants. And the fascinating thing to us was is that as we tracked uh, the giants, their culture, their uh, civilization, their eating habits, and their eating habits, they were cannibals. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, the growly, jolly green giant is not what we're talking about. We met with uh, different Native American elders, uh, and we got a picture that was unusual. Now, they told us they know where the giant bones are, and they wouldn't let us see the giant bones, yet they would talk about the giant society that the, uh, if you will, the medicine men get together, and they open up portals, okay? Now, they maintain their opening up portals in our day and age, and that literally the giants tell them what's coming on the scene. In other words, the giants that are somehow held back are giving them uh, information, and these are the people in the giant society that are absolutely as serious as you could even imagine that the giants are going to return soon. Now that goes along within our second DVD, True Legends, the series, we're, we're at the unholy sea. We actually have the pilot on record as flying a dead giant out of Bagram Air Force Base. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fast forward, he contacted me, uh, I forget what year it was, but fast forward to just a couple years ago, and the same pilot that flew the dead giant out of uh, Afghanistan was in a bar. I believe it was in New Mexico, and one of those beer bars. And the deal is, is that a Native American came over to him and basically uh, started to speak to him and uh, sang some sort of a, uh, I guess you'd say a tune or, or something, a, a chant or whatever it was. And Alan said that the, the Native American made the statement to him, you have seen giants, the giants are coming back. Alan hmm. had never seen the guy before in his life and never encountered it. It kind of blew his mind because uh, he said one of his friends went over and sat in the other part of the uh, uh, restaurant bar and this went kind of like, you know, woo-woo on him. But when, when we're talking about this, we're not only after the bones, Derek, you know. Basically, Tim and I are on not only the trail of the giants, but we're going after the live ones also. Mm -hmm. Tim's experience in South America and uh, the travels that he's done the idea is this the giants have been kept from contemporary history relegated to fable and myth in order to take away from uh, not only their significance but the reality in order to bring them back at a given point in history even up on the hills in cherry hinton in the early 1800s um, some very large skeletons were discovered at a place called the War Ditches. Strangely, uh, at the base of the hill, there's a site called Giant's Grave, uh, and there's a megalith there with a footprint in it, which we're going to have a look at later, at these giant footprints. But also, there's legends of giants up on the hills there, and this is right, on the, literally on the hill that my school was on. Um, so I was quite intrigued that even in your local vicinity, you actually find um, records, if you know where to look, of these strange giant skeletons. And even the pub that's right at the base of the hill is called the Robin Hood and Little John pub. Little John was known as a giant himself. Uh, throughout the world, there's different cultures going back into different parts of history and prehistory that depict giants, not only in the rock carving that you can see here, but in their legends and their stories and in the folklore and sometimes uh, the way they're described it seems very matter of fact it's not just stories um, for example there's a whole story in Glastonbury where I currently live in England um, uh, at the Abbey there back in the 1100s uh, the monks were digging up this area which legend stated King Arthur was buried in and they dug down to a certain level and they came up with a strange cross 
which states that King Arthur is buried here, which is, you know, no one really knows if King Arthur existed. When they dug down several feet further, I think another 12 feet or 16 feet or something, eight feet, they actually found this great coffin and they found this extremely large skeleton. And it was described, and it was also double checked by several people, it was described as absolutely gigantic. It appeared to be much taller than an average man, and the space between the eye sockets was as wide as the palm of a man's hand. Apparently this famous king was truly larger than life. So this is just, again, in where I currently live now, in Glastonbury. Not, no one there really knows about this. There's another King Arthur connection here, um, this time uh, in the Wye Valley. And in the, around 1700, the skeleton of a giant stature was discovered again with a name relating to King Arthur. There's lots of places that don't relate to King Arthur in England, obviously, uh, one or two. But this, I'm just going to run through some examples of some reports that myself and Jim uncovered over the last year. Um, just you find them in local history books, um, you know, records of villages and towns. And often in foreign newspapers, often you don't find the original reports in the English newspaper records anymore. So you have to look abroad and you find references to the English discoveries. This is just one, um, a very large sized man and the teeth were perfect. This is something we'll come on to shortly because even in North America and in different parts of the world, somehow they had amazing teeth. Whether they were brilliant dentists, or whether their diet was good, or whether, what well, I believe, it was a genetic trait. Uh, there's something strange about this that keeps reoccurring all around the world. Even at Stonehenge, uh, there's legends of giants that go very far back. Uh, it, originally, it was called the Giant's Dance. That was the original name of Stonehenge. Stonehenge is a much more modern name. Um, there was a massive skull that was on display in a local church for over a hundred years that has now disappeared. Uh, that's been witnessed. There's a seven foot skeleton discovered uh, in one of the, um, uh, in the area around Stonehenge. And even down here, um, a nine foot four inch skeleton was found in Salisbury, which is the, the area around Stonehenge. Obviously, this is an artist's impression of what they may have looked like. And also uh, the ancient stories of Merlin. And this is actually the oldest uh, known picture or painting of Stonehenge that ever, ever existed. And it shows a giant building it. Uh, Merlin's down there on the bottom left with the, the nice beard. And he was said to have uh, summoned giants from Ireland to bring the stones over and to construct uh, Stonehenge itself. And so this was a uh, part of the history of the kings of Britain. Um, that goes back to about the during the 1100s. And because Merlin was said to have employed giants from Ireland, I started to look into giant reports in Ireland, and lo and behold, there are several accounts. This one's in Sligo. This is a very, very interesting megalithic area. I visited there last year. Um, and you can see here the skull, the jaw bone, again with teeth in very good condition various other parts of the human anatomy, um, must have been of giant stature. So we know that even though they're not given exact descriptions, they're certainly um, suggesting giants even in that part of Ireland. If we go to the Boyne Valley, Four Knox, for instance, this is one of the major uh, megalithic sites, sort of, they call them tombs, um, with some brilliant rock carvings, all connected with Newgrange and Nouth and other sites in the area. And in, there used to be several mounds around that particular area. And this is where they found um, two of the skeletons were larger in height and width than the largest present day man. Excavations on the surface of the mound revealed several shallow graves containing the skeletons of both babies and adults. And this is the first report that came out about this, but another report came out with more detail. Uh, and it shows that most are around seven feet in height of extraordinary width of shoulder and massive bone construction. These are the type of traits you would find in Cro-Magnon man. Uh, and even, strangely, in Neanderthal man as well. Um, but there's suggestions that the exact same descriptions we find in North America, which we'll come on to shortly. This is the famous 12-foot giant that was on display um, around Ireland and, and throughout England as well in the 1800s. It was petrified in a, in a bog in the area, um, this area in Ireland, County Antrim. It was 12 foot 2 inches high and they literally had to cover up its private parts because women would faint at what they saw. Um, but what happened to it later, it kind of disappeared when it was on a train back to Ireland from London and this is uh, the only photo that remains of it. People think it's a hoax, but this is unknown at the moment. If it is, it's certainly a very good one for the time it was created in. 
There's some other examples in Ireland. This is Louth, um, and it shows you that this person must have been 10 feet high, which is pretty tall, double the height of some of us here. And we come back to England, uh, there's, there's just a few examples here. Um, the nine foot skeleton found in Surrey, a seven foot skeleton um, found in Leicestershire. And even at Stone Circle site up in Scotland, uh, a man of uncommon size was uh, unearthed. Again, in Scotland, we have references here to uh, some bones that are quite fresh and of extraordinary size. Um, Everyone was wonderstruck at the immensity of the bones. He took the lower jawbone and easily put his head through it. It is added that it was a beautiful day, but all of a sudden there came on thunder and lightning, wind and deluging rain, the like of which no man had ever heard or saw. Now, this is very interesting. This is a very strange tradition that keeps happening when ancient sites, especially those of giant legend, are dug up. There's actually a book by Anthony Roberts called Sowers of Thunder, which is based upon this idea that when you disturb a giant's grave, you will hear he somehow had some magical control of the weather and would create thunder and lightning to stop it being excavated. This has happened at megalithic sites that have no references, no legends of giants as well. So this is, I find this particularly interesting and we'll come on to more of that later, especially the connections with that in South America. Uh, again, we discovered a skeleton of large proportions uh, with both legs gathered up. This is in Dor Dorsetshire, uh, at a tumulus in a mound. And this is uh, from a seven foot six inch skeleton from Wakefield from 1846, seven feet six inches tall. And Westmoreland, England, a seven foot skeleton was uncovered. And even in the 80, late 80, mid 1880s, very interesting comments were made about this because um, it was found with a megalithic, uh, within a megalithic site, actually buried within the ground. Seven foot skeletons are a global phenomenon. People were larger in the past, as were the animals larger in the past. It was also said that the funerary urns that were found were well fired, meaning that there was examples of technology, ingenuity and knowledge. This covers all of greater ancestry and paints a different historical picture than what is currently politicised. Now this is still true today. This was over a hundred years ago. This was this comment was made uh, by this professor. So um, I find that very interesting. That still today, there's a an unknown, a sort of hidden history of who these people really were that we are probably ancestors of. A seven foot skeleton uh, found uh, in Portsmouth, England, uh, between three and four thousand years ago. And the discovery of these remains has an interesting bearing upon the legend still persisting of giants who lived in the locality. So even you know, where there's legends of giants, there may be some massive skeletons buried very nearby. Um, this is the nine foot six skeleton uh, found in Durham. The teeth, he said, he took out of a gigantic skeleton of a man. In the middle of the bank was found the skeleton of a human body, which measured nine feet six inches in length, the shin bone measuring two feet three inches from the knee to the ankle, and around it were four large flat stones. This is the same as we find in North America in the mounds. So it seems to be a cross-cultural um, connection here with these, these ancient races between uh, Britain and America. Even down in Cornwall, we find um, la very large uh, bones being discovered. Uh, and there's legends uh, associated with it on the right there. The stone is nine feet high and the legend is that the king was as tall as that. He is said to be buried under the stone, complete with his treasures and weapons. So we find it all over, uh, all over the place. In Wales, uh, this is just a, a local history of Wales. He found that the remains of a tumuli that the person interred was above the common size of men. We go on and on, I've got about, only got about 800 more of these to get through. Um, and in North Wales, in the Great Orme Mines in North Wales, um, which date to around 3,500 years ago, more than 2,500 hammers were discovered, which were of immense size, three times the size pretty much, and they realised that a person had to be 12 to 18 foot tall to be able to wield, wield them and use them. So archaeologists will argue that they're ceremonial hammers, but why on earth would you need 2,500 of them? Um, Again, we find giant hand axes um, discovered in Kent, which are exceptional size and quality, again showing the technological prowess of the ancient giants of, of England. Uh, and this just shows you the pictures of it and where it came from. 
Sheringham in Norfolk, uh, we find a similar description here, uh, where more hand axes were discovered. This is the original newspaper report. Um, no adequate explanation of the purpose which the gigantic size of a Sheringham axe could serve has been offered. Well, I offer it was a massive, tall giant. Again, um, this is in Bedfordshire, not far from where I was brought up in Cambridgeshire. Um, it just shows you some uh, perfect, perfectly preserved skeletons. The male is believed to have been a chieftain, and he must have been a man of magnificent physique, as the skeleton measures six feet six inches, while the head is massive. The woman was laid at right angles to the man, with her feet resting against the side of his body. Again, this is a tradition we find in North America. Uh, these are the very interesting reports here from the Keswick area and the famous Keswick skull. The giant skull from the measurements of the giant skull at the Museum of Keswick, Cumberland County. The stature of the giant must have been in excess of 10 feet or about the height of the Philistine Goliath. Another example in the same area that was discovered in the 1660s, uh, a very extraordinary and prodigious sized giant was discovered. The length of the thigh bone was nearly 6 feet and the skull, the teeth and other parts proportionately monstrous so that the length of the whole body was computed at 21 feet tall. So we're getting pretty big now. Imagine, you know, probably almost the ceiling, I would imagine, up there. And there's, there are references which a lot of archaeologists claim is that many of the giants that are discovered in Britain and Europe are actually Saxon giants because they were a very, quite a large statured race. But some of these are obviously much, much older, whereas this one is an actual Saxon discovery. And even on the continent, um, we find, even in tumuli, um, that the bones of enormous size, double the ordinary in fact, were found in a tumulus. So we find this even on, going onto the continent now. And Italy as well, there's several reports here uh, of, a, of, a, of a race of giants. Um, Archaeologists found the skeletons of a woman seven feet tall in an 11th century grave, which is quite interesting because it's fairly modern. And Turin, seven of the skeletons indicated that the men were seven feet tall of an African race, in going back um, hundreds of thousands of years. And Sicily, this is a very strange story. I'll just read you the, the important parts here. They kind of fell through this chasm and actually found this temple with hieroglyphs and preserved giant skeletons. And, um, and even in the general area, more were discovered. He was informed that some human skeletons of vast size had been dug from the ground about three miles distant from where they made this discovery. Captain Allen placed the bones of the most perfect skeleton in their proper position and found that the skeleton to be 11 feet and four inches in length, Italian measure, which is equal to about 10 and a half feet English. This just shows you the, uh, the woodcut that, was, uh, that accompanied um, the report. And in France, it's just several uh, reports here. I've just highlighted um, some of the important aspects of the reports here. Uh, these are all um, genuine newspaper reports. Um, and you can, look, you can find these yourself online if you know where to look. Um, 14 men on the bottom left here, 14 men of gigantic size were revealed. In each case, the heads were of great size with huge jaw bones, which is unusual to find these. Uh, we keep finding these um, anomalies. In the middle of the top, skeletons of giant warriors uncovered in France. Um, at the bottom there, belonging to a race of men between 10 and 15 feet in height. Uh, and then on the right, eight seven-foot skeletons were brought to light beneath a huge monolith weighing more than four tons, not too far from Paris. So we're finding references all over France, again connected with the megalithic sites. Even in Greenland, uh, we find examples. Um, uh, these strange people, said Captain Jensen, represented the Eskimos of tradition, almost legendary tribe of giants. They were seven, eight, and even nine feet tall. On Tenerife, we find other reports here. Um, these, and it, on Tenerife, you find these very interesting uh, stone-built pyramids, these black, these black um, basalt pyramids uh, on certain parts of the island that were investigated by, by Thor Heridel, um some time ago. What they discovered were of tall stature with proportionate limbs. There were giants among them of incredible size, and they may not appear fabulous. I will not repeat what is said on the subject. Of one, it is generally said as a verified and ascertained fact that he was 14 foot high and had 80 teeth in his mouth. We'll see more examples of this. He's probably referring to double rows of teeth, which is a trait we do find, uh, especially in North America, but in other parts of the world. And even in, near Ankara in Turkey, in the Hittite region, 
there's a report um, that goes back to 1933. Uh, the coffin and skeleton of a Hittite princess of the mysterious race that ruled Anatolia 5,000 years ago. The skeleton of a guard who was seven feet one inches tall are the sensational finds of Turkish archaeologists digging at this town south of Ankara. Now, this is just a couple of hours away from this incredible polygonal wall site of Alajahoyek and also Hattusa, which are well worth a visit. And whilst, whilst we're in Turkey, there's even suggestions that very large uh, bones and skeletons were found um, in southeast Turkey. I put a picture of Gebekli Tepe on the left just to tantalize you. There is no direct connection between these, these uh, bones that were discovered and Gebekli Tepe, but there is in this picture. Um, in the 50s, when they were digging uh, roads for the, in the Euphrates Valley, uh, this is a reconstruction of some of the bones that were recorded and measured. Uh, and they guessed and estimated them to be 14 to 16 feet tall. Uh, which is pretty tall uh, when you think about it. And there are many in that whole area, so this is a kind of the ancient biblical area, there are many uh, reports actually in the Bible of giants. Here's just some examples here. I'm not going to read all of these out to you, but uh, I'll just leave that up there. But just an example, there were giants in the earth in those days, and the classic um, analysis there. And, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak. Uh, and different other reports. I'll leave that up just for a moment, just to give you some um, examples of that, because this is something that has sort of baffled scholars for many years. You know, biblical scholars, uh, Christian O'Brien analysed, um, you know, this, and a, and a brilliant researcher called Patrick Cook. I really, high, he's passed away now, but I highly recommend you look at his work. Cause he was a biblical scholar, and he was very interested in UFOs and giants and unusual uh, accounts in the Bible. And these are some of the examples. Um, that he collected. So I just want to you know, make um, a reference to Patrick there. Um, but it just shows you that even in the Bible we find these reports. This is a very strange story. Um, according to a German newspaper, a researcher called Gregor Sbori uh, went to uh, 100 kil kilometers north of Cairo and a grave robber, a kind of tomb robber, would, was, um, had been you know, involved in some excavations um, going up over many many years and this he had to pay three hundred dollars to get these photos but these are photos of a mummified finger which is so large that they estimated that would have been of a giant who was 16 feet tall so even in Egypt we find these extremely ancient potentially um, giant uh, mummified beings which I would, wouldn't be surprised if there were more yet to be uncovered and revealed as a lot obviously is hidden there as it is in many other places uh, again, even on Philae Island uh, back in 1881, the Temple of Isis on the banks of the Nile, 16 miles below Najd Defar, opened a row of tombs in which the prehistoric race of giants had been buried, the largest 11 feet 1 inch. So even in pharaonic times, or possibly earlier, we find evidence of giants in Egypt. Uh, we get them in Russia. Uh, this is a very large skull. Um, 33 inches, um, oh sorry, 33 inches long bones in the, the mountains of Russian Central Asia, north of the Himalayas. There's more reports as well. These are actually some photos that were taken in 1998 of some skeletons that were discovered in Georgia. It's estimated that the giant man was about nine to 10 feet tall and that the skull was around three times the size of a normal human skull. Uh, they look pretty powerful beings, don't they? And this was commented on by a brilliant researcher called Steve Quayle who said that a four-metre human skeleton was found by two amateur archaeologists in Georgia near the village of Udabno in the summer of the year 2000. And skeletons of giants were also found at a cave near Gora Kazbek, Georgia, in the 1920s. So many reports turning up there as well. And even in Sardinia, there's huge amounts of legends of giants uh, linked with all these megalithic sites on the island. Um, there was a recent TV program uh, in England as well about this, which kind of surprised me. But this is one example here, one of the, uh, the archaeological uh, reports that got commented on in the newspaper. The two skeletons, both intact and surrounded by weapons, uh, furnishings and vases, were more than eight feet tall. However, there are records of much taller ones in that part of the world. Sardinians are descended directly from the giants, from the Canaanite giants. Mm that either came before or during uh, the conquest of Canaan by the Israelites under Moses and Joshua. There was a, uh, a, a pillar that was reportedly found, and I forgot who wrote this down, but one of the Greek historians, if it was uh, Hesiod or Herodotus, but there was a, a pillar that was found in the Mediterranean uh, 
reportedly put up by a group that said, we fled from before the face of Joshua the robber. That's right. Joshua the, son, the robber, son of none. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and we, what I found in the research for my book was that the Amorites who were driven out of Canaan by the Israelites believed apparently that they were descended from the Titans. That's right. Yeah, and, and uh, it seems to us, and this is astounding, that Sardinia, the island of Sardinia, for those who don't know, the island of Sardinia is off the western coast of Italy, of mainland Italy. It is a part of Italy. It's a district of Italy. It's below Corsica. And uh, the island of Sardinia seems to be ground zero for those giants, for the Canaanite giants, that they came and they... Uh, they came together on this island. They did something very unique, the Nuragic culture. Uh, it's called the Nuragic culture in Sardinia. It's a very unique, ancient culture. Nobody really knows much about it. We believe it has Canaanite roots. We believe that the root of that culture, of the, uh, of the native culture of Sardinia, is the culture of the Rephaim, is the culture of the giants mm -hmm. from Canaan. Right. And uh, what's astounding is that all over Sardinia, there's very unique architecture. Uh, that is only found in a couple of other places, um, but in, in very small quantities, whereas in Sardinia, there, are over, there were over 30,000 megalithic towers on the island of Sardinia alone. And each one of these megalithic towers would have taken a massive amount of energy and time to build and resources. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would have taken a strong, powerful civilization to build 30,000 stone megalithic towers. Well, Sardinia is not of that things, big a place. No, it's a, it's a relatively small. It's actually a quite, it's a, it's a large island, but I mean, compared to mainland Italy or, or some other country, right. yeah, it's relatively small. So on one island alone, and uniquely on this island, over 30,000 megalithic towers were raised by some unknown race uh, who, who we call the Neurogic Civilization, who historians call the Neurogic Civilization. And uh, what's really intriguing about that is that associated with these towers are what are called and have been called for generations, the tombs of the giants. And the tombs of the giants are megalithic tombs. Wherever you find Nuragi Towers, you find the tombs of the giants. Hmm. And we have documented and we have interviewed people in Sardinia uh, who've, who've gone on the record talking about not only the tombs of the giants, but the, the bodies of the giants that were once inside those tombs. Hmm. And we're talking anywhere from 9 to 15 feet tall, uh, uh, giants of that stature. And thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of giants were buried on the island of Sardinia. And mm. as I said, the, uh, the people of Sardinia to this day, um, many of them, according to their legends, claim to be descended from the giants. In fact, our main contact in Sardinia, uh, who's in our film, his father, came from a tribe that, that, the, that the Sardinians called the Giants. They were actually called, this tribe was called the Giants. His, his father was over seven feet tall. His grandfather was over eight feet tall. Hmm. And this was common in this lineage in Sardinia. So what we think we've stumbled upon here is literally ground zero for the post-flood giants. Hmm. A stronghold of giants on the island of Sardinia. A holocaust of giants because there's possibly tens of thousands of dead giants in the soil still to this day in the soils of Sardinia and it's really an incredible uh, it's really an incredible cover-up that's happened there and it relates to what was happening in the United States in terms of the Smithsonian cover-up and the and the giants that were once in the United States as you guys alluded to uh, that the, the the kind of cover-up that was happening in the United States in the early 1900s late uh, uh, and 19, all through the 19th century and all through yeah. the 19th century um, is still happening to this day hmm. on the island of Sardinia. Hmm. One of the things that we know about the giants is that the early church fathers and even the Greek historians believed that demons progressed from the spirits of those men of renown who lived prior to the flood. Of course, we know from the biblical and the extra biblical accounts like the book of Enoch, the book of Yasher, uh, that the giants who were in the land in the days of Noah were destroyed. Uh, when did these giants who were buried in Sardinia die and and how much demonic activity, spiritual activity, do you find on Sardinia? Is there any link between that as a hot spot for giants and a hot spot for demonic activity? Well, it is. Um, if you look at the, some of the customs of the neurogic culture, what you discover is the rudiments of Phoenician culture, of 
Canaanite culture. Hmm. So you have the a lot of the uh, uh, Molech motifs all over Sardinia and their little figurines, um, the little statuettes that they discover all the time inside of the tombs of the giants, inside of the Nuraghe Towers. Uh, so there's a lot of, there's, there's a very strong Sumerian Middle Eastern influence on the island, which is very strange in the Mediterranean, especially considering that the only known ziggurat ever discovered in the Mediterranean is in Sardinia. Really? So uh, it's called Monte de, de Codi, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a ziggurat in the style uh, of the Sumerian ziggurats and, and those that were found throughout the Middle East. Right, which kind of preceded the, uh, the uh, they, they look sort of like primitive pyramids, but they are older, the ziggurats are older than the Egyptian pyramids. Yeah, and, they, and these, and these um, this, per, this ziggurat on the island of Sardinia basically solidifies the idea that there was some kind of a Middle Eastern influence happening uniquely mm -hmm. on the island of Sardinia all the towers, the tombs of the giants, I think it's safe to assume, and I think people are going to be drawing the same conclusion after watching our film, that the Canaanite giants were in, were, had a stronghold on the island of Sardinia. Hmm. What's interesting, too, on the neurogic culture, that you even see that in some of the Pueblo designs, like at Chaco Canyon, you see it in the observatories. That's what a lot of people are losing track of, you know, in essence. When Joshua and Caleb went into the Promised Land and drove out the giants, I think word spread really fast, even faster than gossip on the internet, okay? Mm -hmm. So that basically they had to flee for their life. And you said something, I want to deal with the demonism in this, because demons are called lying spirits in the Bible. They're the disembodied spirit, you know, from the Greek word daimonisimai. Uh, to be, they, they had to have been embodied before they're disembodied. What's fascinating now, Derek, is all of the... Uh, overwhelming stories that are on the world newspapers and even the Smithsonian you'll find this interesting they who have done more to cover up the existence of giants are now basically heralding the virtues of cannibalism now cannibalism is interesting it comes from basically the worship of Baal by the Canaanites who demanded human sacrifice and somebody said well where is why is this important because it's the spirit that's been loosed over the years I've been on talk radio, a lot of people have contacted me from all the different, uh, I would say this, the spook world, black ops, that just simply means stuff that most people don't know exists. But there is an overwhelming quest. There's an overwhelming uh, uh, amount of effort being put in to find basically old relics, extractable DNA, i.e., can you imagine a mummy from, uh, you know, 18 feet tall? And some of the people that were involved in the original extraction, the mummies from the Grand Canyon, those were taken to Area 51, hmm. okay? Uh, that's the nice benefit. And, you, the, you know, Tim and I and anybody who's out there researching, you've got to withhold certain bits of information to basically break the feedback loop of coming back to you. But what's really important is, is that the criticisms against Sardinia having giants, and I want to share this, right now the biggest, most well-funded uh, documentary by James Cameron, obviously the director of the Titanic, right. Avatar, I want you to remember this, Terminator, uh, the only man to go down into the Mariana Trench, the deepest point in the Pacific Ocean, who is putting his bucks, big bucks, into the search for Atlantis. The key to Atlantis starts in Sardinia. Even though they started there, they don't get it. Mm -hmm. the, the fascinating, uh, if you will, the genetic tracing, tracking, and I've said this before, and I think you've heard me say this, I've said it a lot of times, but the Human Genome Project was not so much about the human genome, but it was identifying the genes or the genetic markers of the giants, okay? The appetites of demons always express themselves in human sacrifice. Now we've got the biggest, uh, I would say, soon to break uh, story, the pedogate, yep. all of the uh, cannibalism of the little, of the, the wonderful little children, you know, mm. and the sickness that's out there. That's the spirit that's been loosed. So from the time that, you know, we're, we're dealing with, even we were all at Tom and our film crew, by the way, we had a film crew there too, you know, with, uh, with everybody in the desert Southwest. 
And what was fascinating, even though the Native Americans knew that these giants were basically destroying them, eating them, uh, Tom has talked about the Sand Canyon, uh, the giants literally, the, the Anasaze, the ancient ones, the alien ones, were running for their lives, and they were literally lunch on the hoof, okay, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. lunch on the foot. So there was always a denial in, in I would say this, the denial by ethnographers, uh, by anthropologists, that there was any cannibals in the United States has now been put just to total rest. The burial mounds, and they, they call them the Adena and the Hopewell, we can trace all of those to basically South America, Mesoamerica, Latin America, yeah, you know. And what's important that people understand is this, is that even in Texas, the Car uh, uh, some people pronounce it Karnakawa, the other people pronounce it Karankawa, but the, the appetite of demons was always expressed through these cultures, you know, and so it wasn't just ritualism, can ritual cannibalism, it was full scale, you know, uh, what's for lunch. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fascinating that now we're, we're coming full circle. And, you know, that's pretty hard for most people. That's the ultimate taboo. But now we're seeing it in, in the headlines. Now we get onto the Smithsonian files. This is where it all gets a bit sinister, shall we say. Because the problem in America is when you're trying to research this particular subject is the lack of bones. Simple as that. Where are the bones? Everyone keeps asking us that. So we were, me and Jim and Ross were actually on a mission to try and find some of these bones and skeletons and teeth. And we're hoping some are going to come forth. But in hundreds of the reports, literally hundreds of the reports, it ends by saying, the bones have been taken away by the Smithsonian for further investigation. And they never get heard of again. A few years later when the, the farmers with the land they discovered it on, they go back there to try and find them. No, we have no record of that. There's even, there's even receipts of you know, them paying for skeletons, like $500 receipts and things like this. Disappeared, everything. They've all been disappeared, the whole lot. Um, so this is the first level of kind of cover-up conspiracy when the Smithsonian got involved. And they got so involved, it got to a point where they were, as soon as there was any report, they, they, would set, they employed about 200 people to go out to mound sites, to go out and find any reports and to get all the skeletons to disappear them as quickly as possible. A couple of reports here. This just shows you, um, he actually mentions his name, which is quite unusual to find that but his name is in the same headline as a giant human skull that was discovered, which really annoyed him, I think, at the time, because he wanted to kind of keep it quiet. Uh, here, here's one here, bones of abnormal size. Two of the largest bones, and the only two perfect ones we found, were a thigh bone and a jaw bone. Uh, each stood six feet, and if we measured the thigh bone correctly, it was about two inches longer than ours. My friend, with a full face full of whiskers, could slip the jaw bone off and on quite easily. Thighs and skulls sent Smithsonian. Never heard from again. Another example here, this is actually um, um, from um, a private um, local history. Uh, some years ago when Ben Smith found uh, this, uh, sorry, some years ago when the Colonel Ben Smith mound was opened by Professor Norris of the Smithsonian, he found the skeleton of a giant which measures seven feet eight inches in length. Also a stone axe was discovered which was huge. Again, we have the Smithsonian involved here. Uh, this is the time when they were starting really in full flow of going to all the different sites to make sure they recovered the bones and disappeared them. Because not only did it go against evolution, it went against their racist agenda. Um, some other examples here, a representative of the Smithsonian Institution has been here investigating the curious relics. Uh, 14, and this one was 14 feet high, no wonder they were interested. Nashville, Tennessee, uh, the almost perfectly formed skeleton of an Indian seven feet tall was unearthed here today. Uh, again, efforts will be made to have representatives of the Smithsonian make a complete investigation of the site, never to be heard from again. More examples here, seven foot tall skeletons, uh, again, Smithsonian getting involved. Um, again here, uh, this is quite an interesting one actually, a ten, feet, um, ten foot skeleton skull, but what's weird about this one, it's talking about technology, as corroborative proof, the members now are exhibiting the rusty and time-worn barrel of what appears to be an ancient gun weighing between 25 and 30 pounds, resembling a flintlock rifle. This, they said, was picked up beside the skeleton. These bones will be taken out of the cave at the earliest possible date and carefully packed and forwarded to the Smithsonian Institution. Yay! 
God, okay, more examples here. Uh, Giants, Smithsonian, there you go. Um, uh, this is the last slide of the Smithsonian, but we've got like uh, probably 130, maybe 150 reports that end with the Smithsonian. No, maybe, I think it might be 250, in fact. Uh, so it's just a few examples here. Um, and these were mostly found in lakes, but, uh, sorry, mounds, but often they were actually found just when digging deep at the foundations of houses, not just mounds. Um, uh, the jaw and teeth are unusually large. The bones have been sent to the Smithsonian Institution for further investigation. Smithsonian Institution determined age of skeleton found in Ohio. La di da. Okay, so we're getting a picture here. Uh, and the problem is when you actually go to the Smithsonian and you ask them, can I see the, the hundred giant skeletons you've hidden? They go, no, don't know anything about them. You can show them every single report. There is, nah, nothing. You can't break through. It's a really tough one, tough nut to break. So we're kind of, we're trying to work out different ways to get in there. We've, we've, we have found evidence and are continuing to find evidence that, that giants, for example, let's, let's deal with Peru, a, a place in specific Peru. Um, we know for a fact that the chroniclers of Peru uh, recorded that the bodies and bones of giants were discovered unequivocally were discovered and, discovered and these aren't mastodons and giant sloths these are uh, gigantic humanoid entities with humanoid skulls and fingers and toes wearing jewelry and dinosaurs don't wear jewelry so uh, and, and many of these discoveries were of bodies that were in excess of 15 feet so 15 plus feet tall in fact in uh, our film, our, our, our second edition, episode two, The Unholy Sea, opens up with the testimony of an AC-130 pilot, who's still active duty to this day, uh, who actually transported the body of a recently killed giant out of Afghanistan. And uh, it was uh, out of Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan. And uh, he saw the body, he touched it, he pounded his fist on it, uh, he saw the fingers and the toes and the feet that were wrapped in canvas. And, uh, and he was met there, by the way, when he pulled in with his AC-130. It was a routine mission for him. He didn't know what he was picking up. But as soon as he pulled in and got out of his, air, got out of his uh, aircraft, he was met by what he described to us as the babysitters. And these were uh, uh, military individuals who were accompanying the body of the dead giant. And they informed him immediately, no pictures. Uh, you can't take, record any information, no making notes about this. Uh, this is extremely top secret. And they accompanied the body of the giant all the way to its final destination. And having watched True Legends, and, and by the way, you, you'll be amazed, having watched it, this, uh, we're talking giant here. We're, we're not talking the, about somebody eight feet tall. This giant, we, it, he was estimated to be around 12 feet tall. Now, there's, an, there's other sources out there that are corroborating this story. Hmm. And they say that he was more like 15 feet tall. Our, the, the guy we interview, our pilot says he was, he was at least 10 to 12 feet tall, maybe larger, but we know exactly how much he weighed because they weighed him. Of course. They weighed him <clears> before, <throat> they put the, before they inserted the pallet yeah. that he was laying on, before they inserted it into the cargo bed of the, uh, of the AC-130. And he weighed at least 1,000 pounds. That's how wow. much this guy weighed. So, yeah, this isn't just a big guy. This is a monster. Now, let's uh, suppose, and, uh, and I have no problem believing this, that this is a true story. Maybe there are others out there in very, very isolated locations. Where in the world do they come from? Well, the Bible says where they came from. There were encroaching spirits from on high, dark spirits. In fact, uh, I have my little faithful copy of the book of Enoch here, and it talks about... Uh, uh, an angel by the name of Azazel, uh, who led 200 other angels who came down on Mount Hermon. And they knew they were violating God's law when they did it. You go through the entire book of Enoch, this evil thing that these angels did uh, produced giants. That's right. It, it produced hybrids. That's right. Uh, if you will, human alien hybrids. Now, this is in the Bible. By the way, the book of Jude quotes Enoch directly. So what can I say? We're not talking about some fantasy here. Yeah, and this was, a, this was the common view of the Jews in Jesus' day. 
So when he would talk to them, and when, and when, and when Peter talks about the angels that uh, kept not their estate but are bound in chains of darkness, this was common knowledge among the Hebrews of that time. And not only among the Hebrews, every, ancient, every major ancient civilization has a similar narrative of the gods, uh, these entities, these beings descending from heaven and commingling with the human race, taking from among the children of men, the daughters of men, wives, and copulating with them, and producing, as a result, offspring that were not fully human and were not fully of the gods. These were the demigods, and in many cases giants, but not just giants, all kinds of beasts and, and, and creatures, illicit yeah. creatures. These, these, were, uh, these were creatures that came into existence that were not sanctioned by God. They were not sanctioned yeah. to exist, so they were wholly evil. And we see these things in, uh, in rock carvings. We see chimeras, half one animal, half another. Uh, we see all kinds of strange beasts at, that were worshipped by the people of the old world who thought that this was something really great. Uh, that these gods had come down and produced all kinds of genetic corruption. And yet God destroyed the whole world. Uh, and then after uh, the flood, uh, this, this thing started once again. And you have evidence that, in fact, you've, you've gone to some amazing places to find evidence that there were giants with high technology of some sort who lived, what, uh, 3,000 years ago, and we're building things that are still extant today. Right. And not only giants, but who knows what other kind of entities were involved. Uh, many people are familiar with uh, the elongated skull phenomenon. Right. And we, we deal with that in our film as well. Uh, so there's any number of situations that are plausible regarding the building of the megaliths. But this is a fact. They were built in the world before the flood of Noah. These are not edifices that were raised by the Inca, by Bronze Age civilizations. Uh, the Inca in Peru, the Incan Empire are credited with the megaliths in Peru. And some of the most amazing and massive megaliths on the earth are attributed to, to a Bronze Age level civilization that did not have, that wasn't even in possession of the wheel. And you're talking about uh, <clears throat> people taking copper tools and maybe stone hammers or maybe copper hammers and chiseling andesite and granite, very, very hard, hard rock, and making huge edifices. Impossible. Can't be done. These things have stones of the most unusual size and shape. That, how much do they weigh? Well, they weigh hundreds of tons, and these are polygonal stones. In other words, they are multi-shaped, and they're randomly shaped. They're randomly shaped in order to fit with the stones that are adjacent. So in other words, a very large block was somehow carved specifically and precisely to fit with the stones that were placed around it. We're dealing with hundreds, stones that weigh hundreds of tons. So not only did they have to somehow extract these stones from the mountainside, they had to move them somehow, and then they had to carve them, lift them, set them into place with such precision that you cannot stick a blade between a lot of these mortarless joints and that's a key mortarless joints because there is a technique in the old world when i say the old world i mean the world before the flood of no the pre-flood the antediluvian world a technique known as cyclopean masonry and that's a term that comes out of mainstream archaeology traditional mm. archaeology cyclopean masonry and the reason why they call it cyclopean masonry which involves the c construction using very large blocks without the use of mortar the reason why they call it cyclopean masonry is because the greeks attributed that kind of masonry to the offspring of the gods, ah. which were general, generalized in the Cyclops. The Cyclops was an offspring of the gods, and so they called it Cyclopean masonry because it could not have been built, built with human hands. It was built by the offspring of the gods. So in a way, the Greeks corroborate the Bible narrative. They do, in many ways. So you're talking about masonry, and we'll, we'll put up some, things, some uh, shots for you to look at as we're talking here. But uh, a place uh, like Sacsayhuaman, if I'm pronouncing it. Sacsayhuaman. Sacsayhuaman, which is a, how big is it, the, the whole facility? This well, this way? is the thing about Sacsayhuaman that uh, many uh, people who go and visit, even researchers, don't realize, is that what you're looking at is literally only the tip of the iceberg, which you can actually see at Sacsayhuaman for a number of reasons. Number one, because the Spaniards took apart 
a lot of the walls, the higher, smaller blocks, they took them apart, and they used those blocks to rebuild, uh, yeah. to build their own, I should say, to, to, to construct their own edifices inside of the city of Cusco, within the city of Cusco. But that's known. But what's unknown is that, uh, unknown to most, is that the vast majority of that complex is still under the ground. It's buried beneath the sediment of the mountain. In other words, when you look at Sacsayhuaman as it stands today, it's absolutely impressive. It's mind-blowing. But then to consider that you're only looking at a small portion of the, of the, of the entirety of the complex is absolutely mind-blowing, and it, it, it completely destroys the notion that this thing was built by, um, by a Bronze Age civilization, such as the Inca. And again, they're the ones who are, are attributed with the building of these walls. But the Inca themselves never claimed to be the builders. And in fact, uh, Inca lore points to giants being the builders of those walls, or demons, as, uh, as the Spaniards thought. These megalithic constructions have been known uh, for, for decades, and people have been visiting them. But what's happening now is there's a collective awakening happening, especially among Christians. And they're beginning to connect the dots that when the Bible talks about Genesis 6, when it talks about the sons of God coming and, and taking wives from the daughters of men and the, the giants that were produced as a result, that these things were literal and that the evidence in stone and the evidence carved into the earth in, 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 uh, as we were talking about the geoglyphs earlier points to this very narrative mm -hmm. and, and, in, and in a way exclusively to this very narrative. And the narrative uh, goes from one end of the Bible to the other. It starts in Genesis, you come to Revelation. The old ones are going to be released in the end times to torment human beings on earth once again. And I think that they will uh, unveil phenomenal powers, the same kind of powers they used to, uh, to create all these enormous projects in the beginning. Uh, they're going to be released as part of God's judgment. The old ones then are about to make their appearance, and I think what we're doing right now is uh, we're in, the, in the, uh, the, the part of history where bit by bit there's a, a disclosure going on. There is. I think we're in the midst of, of what could be described as a soft disclosure. In other words, things are uh, being leaked purposely from different institutions, from the Vatican, from uh, also from NASA and different institutions around the earth that are suggesting to the populace that there is something to all of this and it is a, it's, it's the proverbial boiling frog scenario yeah. uh, and, and, and uh, the, 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 the human populace on the earth right now is slowly being acclimated to the idea that we're not alone in the universe, that there's extraterrestrial origins uh, to the human race uh, on the earth, and in my estimation, that's going to be part of the lie that's being crafted uh, even as we speak. And I believe that there's going to be soon, uh, because they're not going to be able to keep a lid on this uh, for too much longer. Right. Uh, because of all the revelations that are happening all over the earth, everybody has cameras now. So when there's a UFO, uh, when there's a, 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 some sort of an object hovering in the sky, you get a dozen people who pull out their cameras with, with high definition. Um, video recording capacity on them and they begin to record and instantly upload them to the internet. That's right. So you can't hide this stuff any longer. So what do you do? You just come out and tell the people that this stuff is real? Well then you might, there, there may be chaos, but the most important reason why they wouldn't do that is because they're interested in controlling the narrative. They don't want people to draw their own co conclusions, especially not conclusions that are derived from the text of Scripture. The Antichrist system then is already in, a, in, in play. That is to say, a, a, a massive worldwide system of propaganda is in play. And by the way, that, that's a big part of, of this DVD. Uh, we have people on earth now who are looking, they're watching, and they believe that in fact they have built gigantic instruments which they believe will allow them to see the old ones returning once again. Can you believe what I just said? This is a strange thing to have to utter in public, that there are actually people on earth looking for the arrival of, of the old ones, right. the fallen angels. That's right, and, 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 and what people have to understand in order to make sense of, 
uh, of those kind of statements because they are hard to believe unless you have an understanding that you have uh, you have an you have an echelon you have a hierarchy in place you have um, the the Luciferian occult elite who are not only looking for the return of the gods but are trying to catalyze their return are trying to open gates are trying to through sorcery and through all kinds of different uh, illicit means trying to make contact and bring about the resurrection of the golden age which was the world before the flood of Noah but then you have uh, um, multitudes of scientific people who are involved in some of these projects the one specifically that you are referencing is Mount Graham and the Lucifer device you have all kinds of right. of scientists working on those, with those telescopes who have no idea that the data that they're collecting is being used by that upper echelon, that occult society, the Luciferian elite, who have completely different designs for the information and the technology that's being developed. So most of the scientists working uh, with these telescopes or working at CERN or working on these high-tech projects uh, are working on them believing that they're just advancing human knowledge or they're trying to develop technologies that are useful to the human race or they're trying to look for exoplanets which is what they publicly declare about Mount Graham they're looking for exoplanets where alien life might be possible but I believe that uh, uh, again the occult elite the, uh, the, 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 the ruling established occult Luciferian elite already know that these things exist they're not looking for them they're trying to bring them back and to become part of the power that they believe will come down. In other words, it's, it's a power grab. Uh, if we can control this, we can control exactly. the world. Well, that's the story of the Antichrist. Exactly, and that's, they, they pledge allegiance to the prince that is to come.